Hello and welcome to The Gaggle, where we challenge and, if necessary, destroy media narratives. I'm George Samueli. With me today, of course, is uh, co-founder of The Gaggle, Peter Lavelle. And today we have a special guest, um, Brian Berletic, uh, who also goes by <laughs> Brian Berletic. So it's up to you how you want to pronounce it. He uh, is a, a geopolitical analyst. Uh, he makes outstanding uh, YouTube uh, videos. He interviews many uh, interesting uh, political analysts. And his uh, YouTube channel is called uh, New Atlas, and it's very well worth um, following because there's all, always very interesting videos and very interesting interviews. So we're very fortunate um, to have you here, Brian. And I'm going to kick it off with a topic that Peter and I were discussing yesterday, which is that how do we get to some kind of a, um, a settlement when uh, it's clear for Russia, the, the conflict in Ukraine is an existential matter. It's, it's, it cannot possibly uh, give in to uh, you know, essentially Western demands. Um, while uh, NATO for reasons of its own and out of no necessity has made the war in Ukraine an existential matter for NATO. So NATO cannot uh, make any uh, serious concessions. So the question is, where do we go from here? How, how do we get out of this? How do we can't reach some sort of a, uh, a peace agreement? Um, unfortunately, I think it's going to have to be settled on the battlefield, much the way the conflict in Syria was. Uh, there were multiple attempts to create some sort of deal or, or to get some sort of talks going between the militants and their sponsors. And of course, it wasn't until Russia intervened in 2015 until things developed on the ground that just simply made the proxy war impossible to, to continue the way that it was. That's when uh, Turkey started changing its tune. The United States just dug in in eastern Syria. And I think we're going to see a very similar process unfold in Ukraine. Well. The, the the problem with that is, uh, as George and I have discussed in many many times, is that uh, we there cannot be just a freezing of the conflict because, as George and I have said repeatedly, um, the NATO will try this again in five years or ten years or fifty. They, they, it, it will be unrelenting, and then it, and the whole issue of Ukraine's membership in NATO is moot. I mean, it is NATO, okay, because NATO is there. Exactly. So that's why you know the. the, the for, for for both of us thinking about this for eight years, not just 10 months, but eight years, is um, there has to be a resolution in terms of the regime in, in Kiev, okay? Um, they, they, we can't have Banden, um, Banderistan in Ukraine on Russia's border, okay? Why, and George and I have talked about this yesterday, why NATO has made this craven choice that it's existential when it isn't, okay? I mean, maybe reputational, civilizational, but not security, not in terms of security. Right. And that's why it's asymmetrical because Russia is uh, committed to this conflict for its security. NATO for all other reasons, but security. Uh, that's a really good point that you bring up there. Uh, NATO continues to claim that it's existential, but but like you said, it is not. Maybe as an institution, because of its reputation, its claimed stated uh, purpose for existing, but in terms of actual security, no, no. Uh, none of these, you know, the NATO members, their biggest threat is uh, missiles fired by Ukraine landing in their in their territory and killing their civilians. That. And, and these extremists that they're arming in Ukraine, uh, filtering into the rest of Europe, that, that bust that Italy made, these extremists. So, I mean, the, the, they're, they are their own worst enemy. Uh, if, I could just follow, if I could just sure. follow up, is that all of, with, with the, the um, expansion of NATO since the end of the Cold War, the countries that were part of the Warsaw Pact, they joined the military alliance with the belief that they would never have to fight anything. Okay, that, that it, it was a false prom. It was, it was based on a false premise. It was more of a club, a political club. Uh, 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 you get into NATO, then you get into the EU. I mean, th there's a pattern here. So they, they joined this alliance never thinking that well, we'll never have to fight because how many of them spent enough money to have a viable military force in the first place? Hardly any of them. So it's, it's really a pyrrhic 
organization. And now it puts its very existence on the line for reasons that, for other reasons than security. And security has never been at the core of NATO's mission. Uh, again, a really good point. And part of the reason why Russia feels threatened is because what has NATO done? They have uh, engaged in wars of aggression nowhere near uh, NATO's actual uh, boundaries. And that, you know, this is something that they are doing openly in pursuit of encircling and containing Russia. So uh, again, it is a very good point. It's important for people to understand. It's also important for people to understand a lot of these uh, nations joining NATO, they usually are doing it after some form of U.S. meddling in their internal political affairs, uh, removing a sovereign government in placing uh, a client regime. Right. Elite capture. Yeah. Elite capture. Right. But that's, exactly. that's what's uh, very interesting here, because, you know, they joined this uh, club, as Peter put it, um, as, you know, the, the road toward the European Union. Um, and obviously thinking, well, this is nice. You know, we've got somebody else securing uh, our borders. We've, you know, some, you know, somebody else is going to take care of it. We don't have to take care of it. You know, they, you know, the big powers, they're going to take care of us. But the problem is, is that because NATO is an aggressive alliance and uh, basically has to expand in order to justify its existence, it means that NATO is getting into all sorts of uh, international crises that, that threaten these very countries. So in other words, the countries who thought, hey, we're getting peace and security because somebody else is going to take care of us, suddenly, no, <laughs> you are now in the front line. Because you know, if, if it does come to a shooting war between uh, Russia and NATO, then all of the states, you know, in Eastern Europe and Central Europe, they're in the front line. You know, wherever you know NATO has its military bases and it, it, its uh, its ports and and uh, air bases, they're all in the front line. They'll immediately be attacked. So, you know, joining NATO wasn't such a great bet for them. And, and think about it this way too: uh, when they do go to Afghanistan or uh, go to engage in warfare in Northern Africa. Th that is NATO members putting their troops in, in danger. And in the case of Afghanistan, losing troops and equipment, and spending money, uh, again, on a war uh, against a nation that posed absolutely no threat to anyone in NATO. So it is, it's the ultimate irony that NATO is supposed to be a defensive alliance, and yet it is the greatest threat to every member in it, except for maybe the, the small handful of special interests driving it. But I would say even to the United States collectively as a nation, it is a threat to the United States as well. Yeah, because, because the, 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 the dilemma that NATO has at least theoretically had to address, it never had to do it in reality until today, is it would the Americans sacrifice Tallinn for Chicago, okay? And, and again, that was just purely theoretical. Now they're putting it to the test. And it's really quite terrifying, um, partic particularly when we have this. Um, what I, I made a program on it, the missile of um, no, the, the the missile of November. Okay, and for the first time in our lifetime, that was really put to a test, and it was really quite terrifying, particularly since the AP for maybe out of incompetence or it was done intentionally, I, I, I don't know, but, um, you know, put us on a, 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 a trigger, a trigger alert here, okay? And, and it's really extraordinary that the decision makers don't comprehend what the entire pan-European security uh, architecture was really supposed to be about. As if, it's as if they don't understand the indivisibility of, of security. I mean, I, you know, I, I, George and I reflected upon this. What was it, George? It was like in January, early February, and the, the people was talking about in the indivisibility of security, and it was as if somebody had dusted off the right. Helsinki <laughs> agreement. Like, right. what does this term mean, actually? Okay. Right. Right. Yes. Yes, no, that, 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 that's exactly right. And um, then, then the NATO uh, crowd decided to get very cute and uh, because the Russia had brought up the, the Helsinki uh, final act which, where it talked about the indivisibility of security. So they said, oh, hey, yeah, Hels Russia is violating the Helsinki final act because it, you know, it, it outlaws aggression. Yeah, it, it does, but it also says security is indivisible. You can't enhance your security at the expense of someone else. So that, that, you know, that's that's the way it is, yeah. But yeah, what, another, what you right? another issue is that, you know, that uh, like article, we keep hearing about article five of the NATO treaty, but 
everybody seems to forget article one is it don't get yourself into a situation where you're finding yourself in a conflict, particularly if you're initiating it here. Yeah. It, it's really, it, it's it, the how myopic the elites are in the West. They invoke these things without having the vaguest understanding. Even Article 5 is vaguely understood by the elites. Very, very right. vaguely, yeah. Exactly. Anyway, go, go ahead, Brian. Uh, I, I was just going to say that uh, even at this point, there are all sorts of bridges that Russia could burn if it wanted to between itself and the rest of the West, the United States, all of Europe. And they're not doing that. And uh, that is self-evident that Russia was never interested in a conflict with the West. They were not. They're still, even at this point, even though there is a proxy war being waged against them, the West, the collective West, the leadership of the West, I should say, attempted to destroy the Russian economy, they're still thinking about somehow uh, maybe working together in the future. They don't want to burn those bridges. And that just doesn't seem like the actions of a, of a nation that is an actual threat to the West. And we see the West doing this everywhere to everyone. It's not just, you know, it's funny how the other great conflict that everyone is watching is between China and who? The United States. There's a there's a common denominator here. It seems like the United States is is the problem. It, it's not everyone in the world is the problem. If, if it seems like that, it's probably you that's the actual problem. Well, so do you think that, yeah, Don, just following up on your comment, um, do you think then Russia is uh, making a mistake by continually holding the door open for rejoining the club? Well, I, I think right now, uh, there's, there really is no prospect of Russia and the West getting back together. But the, the Russians, I think, understand that the, the, the West is not only its leadership, it is uh, ten, hundreds of millions of people. And it's just like with Turkey in 2015. From 2015 onward, Russia was engaged in Syria. Turkey actually downed uh, at least one warplane. They ambushed the rescue team that came to uh, look for the pilot. Russia, uh, against everyone else uh, watching this conflict, they wanted Russia to retaliate and they refused to. And they were they were very patient and calm and thinking very long term. And we can see how that's paying off now. The world is going to change, I think, much quicker than people realize. And I think Russia is thinking about this. Uh, it, and it's it's lucky for everyone else on Earth that there is at least one proverbial adult in the room in amid this conflict because the Western leadership, no. And they're they're creating so many risks uh, for their own people, which they don't care about, but also for themselves. And they they really don't seem to realize the gravity of the situation, the corner that they're painting themselves into, really. Brian, it's, it's, I find what you said just said is fascinating about the 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 Russians are 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 not the the uh, they're not the they're not the ones burning bridges. I think you, I think that you're onto something here because again, it, it if it's going if the, uh, bridges are going to be burned, then it's going to be a Western choice. The West will choose that. Russia will not choose that, but Russia will accept it once it happens. I think that's, that's again that's something new that I, I've heard, and I think that you're absolutely right about it. I've actually kind of thought about it in a different way, but this puts it in in a in a better format. Yeah, I, I see that too. Um, the The fact of the matter is that Russia and Europe are right next to each other. That's not going to change. Okay, no. they realize the realities of that. Now it'll be up to the West to what the terms and conditions of the kind of relationship they've had. But we have seen over the last 10 months, and I live here, okay, um, the West can be a source of convenience, but that's about it. Life but, goes but, on. But Peter, but this is then uh, raises the issue, which I, I uh, mentioned before, that if uh, Russia is not willing really now to put the screws into the West, I mean, the West has got itself into this mess, particularly Europe, the European economy through its sanctions policy. So now, essentially, the, what the Europeans are doing is going around in through the back door and saying, well, maybe we can just somehow ease the sanctions a little bit. You know, maybe we can cheat a little bit here, get something on the, you know, through on the back burner. And, you know, and if Russia relents and says, oh, OK, look, we're human beings, you know, we're very humane, then essentially Europe is not going to suffer its consequences. It, it will get through this winter, which is what it's really worried about. It'll get through its winter without suffering too many adverse consequences. And that's not a good situation for Russia. So that policy of, well, let's still keep keep a, a handout for the West, that may not serve Russia's interest right now. 
Well, also to add on to that, um, you know, there's a whole issue of reciprocity. I mean, Nord Stream, Nord Stream one and two. I mean, on the same day, if I'm not mistaken, there was a a, a new pipeline in the Baltic that was uh, um, initiated. I mean, you know, oops, something happened to that, but it has it hasn't happened, and I don't see that the Russians would do that. So George actually presents kind of a quandary because um, Russia doesn't want, even though the West will demonize Russia as the aggressor, Russia doesn't doesn't see itself as that and doesn't want to participate in something that could be perceived as that. But it, you know, then now I can argue against myself. It's kind of a moot point. It doesn't really matter um, what, um, uh, the, the Russians don't really care what the West think because they will think whatever they want. So uh, George presents a very good question. Uh, with, with Russia, a, a lot of people are frustrated with the way they're conducting special military operation, why they're not engaging in total war, getting this over quickly. Yep. Uh, but this is not just a, uh, this isn't a conflict between Russia and Ukraine. It is a conflict between Russia and the United States and the rest of NATO. It's also a conflict between US-led unipolarism and multipolarism, which includes every other nation on earth outside of the West. And Russia is trying to take that into consideration as well with the way they they are executing this special military operation. If they went in too fast and too hard, they would put uh, all of their partners and potential partners around the world in a very difficult place. Like I, I'm based in Thailand, the Thai government wants to keep the door open to everyone. But if Russia went in very heavy handed right from the beginning, it would have put them in a difficult place. Uh, they, they abstained from one of these UN General Assembly votes that the US was was trying to coerce everyone into agreeing to, they were able to do that because of the incremental escalation Russia is engaged in, where they're, they're doing it almost so slowly, uh, people don't really seem to realize where they are now versus where they were in late February and uh, throughout March. But there's a danger to that, which is that if the war drags on, then, you know, the countries, Thailand, and, and of course, even bigger countries such as uh, India, or Pakistan, you know, they're thinking, well, is Russia going to prevail? I mean, is, will Russia win? Ru does Russia really have the stomach for this fight? Or are they just going to essentially cave? And therefore, uh, they, you know, they're thinking, of which, which side are we going to uh, back? I mean, we're not, we're not going to back a loser. So therefore, there's a, a, a dissipation of confidence in Russia, I mean, they basically many, many of these countries thought, hey, look, Russia's going to pull this off. They're going to wrap it up very quickly and then it'll be over. But it's dragging on and, you know, and therefore they're going to be losing confidence uh, in Russia. Well, there's also the issue, Brian, that's very important from the perspective of where I live is that you, you, if you were to walk down my street right now and you pass 20 people, 10 of them would have relatives in Ukraine. OK, and it, it, this is that's a very different dynamic here, because is the the um, when you have the Benderites and you have the Azov and you have all these other people, those kind of people don't exist here. There's no one is saying, you know, we, you know, let's, you know, we got we got to kill all the Yukis and stuff like that. That that's rhetoric you never hear here. Most people are, that I have contact with on a daily basis, um, they think the cause is just but they want this over and they want it over now, okay? But they want the a positive outcome for Russia because it's their relatives, it's their um, cousins, their their nieces. It's, it's, it's really, really painful from this side. And so I, I think that that's playing a major uh, role in all of this. But I, I, I do think that I agree with both of you. I mean, if there was very hard, you know, war over in three days, you know, Kiev doesn't exist as a geographical location. Yeah, that, that would be really hard for-, for But, but it's interesting, Peter, what you just Go said, ahead. because it just shows that the Russian public opinion, it kind of wants two mutually incompatible things. Which yeah, is, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, as you said, they have, you know, human feelings towards Ukraine, they have relatives there and they feel close to Ukraine. On the other hand, hey, we got to wrap this up quickly and on our terms. So we, you know, we want complete victory. That's, <laughs> that's incompatible uh, goals. There's, there's called, another- That's called being human, George. <laughs> There's another consideration also, though. I, I, I think a lot of people mistakenly compare what Russia is doing in Ukraine to say uh, one of America's many interventions, even just uh, since the turn of the century. Uh, when you compare Ukraine to Iraq, for example, 
it is a mu Ukraine is a much larger country, larger population, larger and better trained, better equipped military. Plus, they have the, the summation of NATO's support behind them. This is what Russia is going into when they decided to launch this, this special military operation. And, and this is the biggest clue of all, that this was not a, a war of choice by, by Russia. When you just look at everything added up, it, it is a huge obstacle to get over. It's not, ever, it's not going to be easy. And I don't really think there was ever a quick way to do it, it unless it was just a total, uh, total mobilization and total annihilation from the very beginning. It, and, and I don't think they were able to do that politically or or militarily i just don't think that it was possible well, the I don't mobilization think it's in no one's interest to have a um a, a failed criminal state in the center of europe okay yes. i'm sorry to interrupt. go ahead no that that's perfectly fine uh and and so uh, when you think about it that way the the mobilization for example if they from the very beginning before it was even uh, launched they should have had these additional truths, but they didn't. And so it, it's a, the ideal way you would want to wage this operation and the practical limitations are, are you know, contrasting each other. They had to kind of wade into this. I think there probably is going to be a, another mobilization, as a matter of fact, before this is all over. But this is something they have to incrementally introduce over time. They cannot do it all at once. Because I think it would it would create domestic and uh, international issues with with their within their own society and with even their allies around the globe. So you think there'll be another mobilization because three hundred thousand just isn't going to get the job done? It's Ukraine is a large geographically. It's a large country. There's a lot of arms flowing in there. So even after the the, the heavy weapons are gone and and NATO is unable to resupply them in terms of heavy weapons. Just look at the situation, say, in Syria. The first thing Russia did when they intervened in 2015 was bomb the supply lines. They, they essentially were cutting the vast majority of the, the flow of weapons into Syria to these militant groups, but they're still fighting to this day. I mean, they're still fighting. There's still a danger there. There's still terrorism. I think this is something that's going to drag on for years, and it's, it's going to require a lot of patience. Uh, hopefully, the you know, the, the military side of it, the war side of it will be over sooner than later. But even that, it, it's hard to tell because again, look at how long the, the military operation in Syria went on for before they were able to take back all of those cities and really, and really confine these Western sponsored militants to the North and, and to the East. Right. But it's it's interesting, and I'll just finish up, that um, you really do need a lot of manpower to win a war. I remember in Vietnam, they had 500,000 troops, and then General Westmoreland went to LBJ and said, we need another 500,000, because we're not going to win with these 500,000. And that was the point at which, you know, Johnson said, enough already. But but that's the point, that, you know, victory requires a lot of manpower, you know, and, you know, a couple of hundred thousand just isn't going to get the job done. Well, I but, think... But also, the, the I I think we're all in agreement that the 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 outcome will be uh, determined on the battlefield. However, um, part of that battlefield is a um, um, dual use um, uh, infrastructure, and um, that's something that um, I think is making a huge difference right now. I, it's widely believed. I have no reason not to believe it that there'll be. Russia will have a winter offensive. Uh, I don't, and I don't think it's a coincidence that we're seeing the degradation of the um, um, the electricity grid in in Ukraine because it is it's so vitally important to get uh, men and material to the front. Now, if you don't have, they have a few diesel trains left. Um, it's not going to make a difference. The 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 damage done to the electricity grid is so is so dramatic. Um, that even if um, left to their own resources, it would take uh, years and years and years. And most of this equipment was made in what was the Soviet Union. The, the Russia still has those um, that kind of technology. The only country that can put the electricity grid back together in a reasonable amount of time 
is Russia. And I think that's part of their calculus, to be honest with you, okay, when there is some kind of battlefield resolution. I mean, just look, look at the apartments being built in Mariupol right now. They're making a big deal about it, rebuilding the city. And so they do have the capacity. I think this is part of the calculation here. And on the other side, and there's something that a number of my guests have uh, uh, predicted that this time in January and February, most of the news is going to be about what's going on in Europe and not what's going on in the battlefield in Ukraine. I think you get my point. Go ahead, Brian. Yes, uh, and I, I agree with you. R Russia would not have withdrawn its troops from Kherson city if they weren't planning to do something very important with them, because I, I believe Russia could have held that city if they wanted to, but it was a distraction from the main objective. This was something that was a liability holding the city on the, the, the west bank of the Dnieper River. That was a liability. They want these troops for something else. So what, what that something is, I don't know, but a, a winter offensive or some major operation of, of one type or another is definitely in the cards. So uh, yes, and the hitting the infrastructure, this is something that if it was the United States, Invading Ukraine, this is something they would have done on the first day. This is what they did on the first day in Iraq, for example, in the exact same manner, too. So Russia has really been holding back. And I think it's interesting. Uh, the West likes to claim that Russia is using this term special military operation as a euphemism for total war. But it most certainly is a special military operation. There are so many more things that Russia can do to escalate. And I think taking out the power grid right now is a demonstration that the, the escalation can continue. It can continue as far as Russia wants. Right. And they're stretching it out this way on purpose. They're giving off ramps on purpose and they're making themselves look like the reasonable actors in this conflict in stark contrast to the Ukrainians and their Western backers. But is that really, um, is, is that really a successful strategy? Because you could easily argue the other way, which is that had they done that, had they done a shock and awe at the beginning, taken out the infrastructure, as you say, which is what the United States would have done, that might have brought the war to a conclusion much more quickly. You, the, the Ukraine authorities would have panicked and said, you know, we need to we need to sign an agreement right now because, you know, we're, we're facing total defeat. And the Americans would have probably said, yeah, go ahead, because I think the Americans didn't think that uh, Ukraine would be able to hold out for very long. So. You know, that might have worked. After remember, there was an agreement. We were close to an agreement in Istanbul at the end of March. So that's that the shock and awe strategy might have been uh, more uh, successful than what they've done. Uh, instead. Yeah, but, but George, the, the, the premise of the special military operation was demilitarization and denazification. OK, and that, I think and because of that, that, those were the stated goals at the time, which I think have evolved through time. They that that's what, how they came up with the calculus for the special military operation, thinking that was enough to do ach achieve both ends. Obviously, that's not true, okay? But so I think the, the premise, the, the, see, the, again, you know, this kind of attachment that Russia has to Ukraine, it's very different. It's not like the American, what, 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 what did Americans know about Iraq or Afghanistan, exactly. okay? I mean, just, uh, it, they're abstractions, okay, for the West, they're abstractions. For Russia, Ukraine is not, you know, I can remember, you know, during the uh, the eight years in which the the Donbass was um, shelled, you know, I would tell anyone that would listen to me and say, you know, when we see the footage of what's going on in the Donbass, you know, it, if you look at the footage and then you look outside your own window, it's the same foliage, it's the same architecture, it's the same people. They're dressed the same way as we are. I mean, that was visceral, and I think that this 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 connection. That, that Russia has very real, very historic relationship with, with Ukraine is, it, it, it is they see Ukraine through that prism and it's very, very difficult for them to um, uh, um, compartmentalize that, you know, military objective and then their attachment to Ukraine. I, they, they, it's very difficult for, I, I think now the, 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 the new um, um, uh, general that they have, what they call him, General Armageddon, um, you know, I basically, I, the way I look at it is he's saying, you know, you have to tell me you want a military victory or you want a, a political victory. Well, that's your job. <laughs> that's not my job. My job is like what we did in Syria. Okay. I don't care about the politics. I care about a battlefield victory. And I think that's what they're on to now. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And I, and 
there's no way to say for sure whether or not uh, Russia could have overwhelmed Ukraine in, you know, uh, in the first week or the first month of the operation, because again, it is, it is bigger. <laughs> it was a, a bigger country, a bigger military, uh, many more sponsors than Iraq and Russia only had a certain number of contract soldiers that they could have gone in, into Ukraine with at that time. So it, it could be, again, it could be a practical limitation uh, if ideally, if Russia could have done this back in 2014, a lot of people wondered why Russia didn't do this back in 2014. The reason was they weren't ready. They're not all powerful. They, they spent all of that time building their military up to fight this specific type of conflict. Uh, and so even now, the, the Garan 2, these kamikaze drones, they just showed up in the middle of this conflict. They did not have that ready at the beginning of the conflict. If they could have had that ready, I think they would have they would have used it at the beginning of the conflict. So uh, it, it's actually very impressive the way they are conducting this operation, considering the practical limitations, also considering that their opponent, uh, the United States, essentially, this unipolar world order, there's no telling what they're going to do. They are looking at the end, the absolute end of their he hegemony yep. worldwide, because it's not just about Ukraine. It's also about if they fail in Ukraine, they also fail regarding Taiwan and the containment of China and the, the subordination of Asia to U.S. interests. All of this is on is at risk right now. Well, that's, it, a, Brian, that's a craven choice. That's a craven choice then. OK, because that, is. Is, that is on, that is a perception and it's <laughs> ideologically informed, but it has nothing to do with reality. <clears throat> Look, South Vietnam fell. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. I mean, it, it, this is with me. I, 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 I can't let this point go but past because I think you're absolutely right. Back in 2014, I had that debate with so many people. There should have been, it should have been a counter regime change, you know, before everything settled. And it was people argued about it up until February 24th. Just wanted to throw that in. Uh, so there's, there's another aspect to it, which is, of course, and you raise this now, Brian. What does the United States do? Because the United States is actually escalating its involvement. It's not de-escalating, it's escalating. I mean, this announcement that they're now setting up this base in Wiesbaden in Germany, um, supposedly to um, uh, you know, oversee the uh, arming and training of Ukrainian troops. However, that's already, that's a substantial force that they're now putting in uh, Wiesbaden. And then we also had the news that they're deploying troops to oversee what happens to the arms that are flowing uh, into Ukraine. Um, so it looks, on well, the face of it, that the Americans are now, you know, directly uh, escalating their own in involvement. It's not just any longer, oh, we're sending arms, oh, we're providing them with intelligence, oh, we're providing them with satellite imagery. It's now they are actually getting directly involved. So that's that that has to be a consideration for the Russians that, you know, that, you know, what, what I, I think has been obvious really from the start, that you may well be end up in a direct um, uh, military confrontation uh, with NATO. And, and I think that's why Russia has been so careful with its military resources and preserving a large force, specifically in case the U.S. and the rest of NATO intervene more directly in one way or another. Again, we have to remember uh, this inflection point that we are arriving at, where Eurasia is going to supplant the West. This hasn't happened in generations. This is uh, American and before that British hegemony. For generations and generations, they are looking 500 at- 500 years, 500 years. Exactly. You look at and, colonialism, yeah. Yes, and, and China surpassing the West, uh, a population larger than the G7 combined. And considering that uh, there, because I, I believe there is a racist component uh, among the, the, uh, the leadership class in the West, the United States, the UK, this for in their minds, and again, it's- it is not a matter of their own self-preservation, but it is the preservation of their, their worldview, and it is imploding. And I'm not sure what they will do uh, in pursuit of this and whether it will actually compromise their own sense of real self-preservation, painting themselves into a corner they cannot get out of, because history is uh, full of people who have, who have painted themselves into corners, or into bunkers under Berlin, for example. I mean, there's a lot of examples of people completely miscalculating and being unable, even in, in pursuit of their own self-preservation to make 
common sense, rational decisions. All you have to do is read Joseph Farrell. He, he actually has <laughs> just said what yes. you, I, I mean, he, he, he let the mask drop, okay? I mean, he's, yes. a, he's a poster child for that worldview, absolutely. But it's very okay. interesting that what you said about the racist view, because if we think of the example of uh, Japan, you know, Japan emerged, you know, first half of the uh, 20th century as suddenly, you know, an Asian power that was challenging the European powers. Uh, but then essentially the Western powers crushed Japan and they crushed Japan in a particular way. They showed their superior technology. I mean, they said, you mess with us. We are much more advanced than you. You know, we can create weapons that would just simply wipe, wipe you off the face of the earth. Don't mess with us. That was done against Japan, and Japan learned its lesson and never never wanted to challenge the West again. Um, so, I mean, the West would certainly love to do that with China, but hasn't quite figured out how how to do that. But that but that is definitely the the objective here. Well, George, as you and I have pointed out here, that's why um, um, uh, degrading Russia is so very important. That is the whole purpose of the proxy war in Ukraine, because this it has everything to do actually with a message to China. Because right. it's, I'm just parroting what George have said. Okay, so um, uh, you know what you what you know degrade uh, Russia. You send a signal to the global majority. I don't like to say global South. The global majority is that who's who's running the the table, and China would be the the only major power that would be dissenting. Okay, with vast resources, by the way, it it it, it, it certainly would make the world a whole lot more dangerous. But that's why this conflict in Ukraine again. It's a choice. They they they, they wanted this. Is where the, the the hill they want to die on. I mean, this is just absurd, absurd to die on the hill of Ukraine. That's why all three of us are just so bewildered by this because it's all a craven choice. It's it's absolutely true, and and it doesn't have to be this way. And imagine what I was following the Nord Stream two construction for for many yeah. years, yeah. and I I saw it as an opportunity for all of Europe. Not, not just Germany. It wasn't just a Russian project. There were German and, and other European companies involved. They were going to benefit from the pipeline directly. And then the cheap energy being piped into Europe is sort of uh, made them competitive in terms of industry. And then the industry was going to be connected to the rest of Eurasia by China's Belt and Road Initiative. It really was everyone rising with the tide in the United States. And I thought, you know, if this pipeline is built and comes online. This is going to be Germany and the rest of Europe's opportunity to get out from under the shadow of US hegemony. And the US, and I knew and I warned people that the US would do almost anything to stop it. And they literally blew up the pipeline. Well, I mean, we don't know for sure, but I, I mean, it's well, pretty who obvious else did who, it? who would have done it. Exactly. Well, no, yeah. it's been, it's yeah. been, it's been what, eight weeks now? No, um, yeah, no investigation. No investigation, you know. <laughs> And no accusations exactly. against Russia. I mean, there were in the first few days, but then that's it. We never heard those accusations again. And just well, you point. know, George, I guess we'll never, we'll never know. know. I get we'll like know. the like the um, January six bomber. Exactly. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll never, never, we'll never know. know. Yeah. Yeah. But that's but that, well, it's very interesting, and I think that it, it goes back to the thing that Peter just mentioned, which was that um, as far as the United States was concerned, it's this Russia China uh, block. That's been really, you know, figuring in their nightmares. I mean, that 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 this, they were heading towards this, and they essentially they want to break it up. I mean, in the way they've decided to do it is to take on Russia first. If they can knock Russia out, then they can take care of China because they don't really think, uh, you know, China is an economic power, but they don't think China has the um, the wherewithal, the dip diplomatic skill. Uh, you know, the, all of the finesse that Russia has developed in the Soviet era and everything of leading a kind of a world uh, order against the United States. They don't think China can do it. So once they can knock Russia out, you know, reduce it back to where it was in the 90s and even worse, they can essentially take care of China and, and deal with China as they did with Japan. Um, so I, I think that's the, 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 uh, the calculations in Washington. And also, George, you know, Michael McFaul, you know, he would, he, I think to this day, well, maybe up until February 24th, but Russia really, really wants to be part of the West, okay? And it, if given the choice, it will join the West against China. These people believe this, yeah. you know, and, and, and the fact is, is that I think, and this is one of my, my hobby horses here, is that in 2014, um, uh, the State Department and, and the European Union 
backed um, nefarious uh, forces in Ukraine with the, with the uh, slogan, civilizational choice. Well, actually they're right. It is a civilizational choice. And most of the world, the vast majority of the world will side with China and Russia when it comes to a civilizational choice, okay? What it means um, to have borders, what, what does a family mean? What does a man and a woman mean? And we, all, we can go all through that. This is because they're so myopically blinded by their ideology, they can't understand that most people find these things not only disturbing, but absurd, okay? And I think that this is, this is the, the, uh, because they're of their ideological possession, they're blinded going back to the very beginning of our conversation about what security actually means. Yes, and uh, look, I'm here in Southeast Asia, Thailand specifically, but I've traveled across the region and I, I've been here for almost 20 years. So I've, I've watched this region transform with the rise of China. I've seen the two systems side by side when the West and you know Japan, again, subordinated to the West when they had primacy over this region, and as it has faded and, and as it's being displaced by China's way of dealing with countries, which is to just do business, building infrastructure, building things that are actually useful, that, that bring everyone up together. Uh, it helps China, it helps the countries they're doing business with. And these countries can see the tangible uh, improvement in their lives. And they're not going to go back to the way things were when the West, I mean, take Laos, for example, north of Thailand, uh, they, they were landlocked, they are landlocked, they had windy roads going through mountains. That was how you had to go from Kuoming, China to the, the border with Thailand. China built a highway, they cut a three day, dangerous three day trip down to 24 hours by road. And now they built a high speed rail link that is now operational and cutting it down to hours. This is going to vastly improve the lives of everyone in not only in Laos, but also in Thailand, because now you have all of these goods and tourists able to travel that much faster over land. So compare that to what the United States was doing, this uh, deliberately keeping these countries impoverished, divided, politically unstable. This is what they have been doing for decades and decades, and, and nobody wants to go back to that. And, and this is why the US has become so dangerous. So Brian, it, it really isn't a choice between autocracy and democracy, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. But I, th and I think that, yeah. yeah. But but what you're saying is is I think very interesting, and I think it's an, an important. The problem is that uh, yeah, China does business, but it's not ideologically sophisticated enough, I think, to challenge the West. I mean, the West is ideological and it's waging an ideological uh, war. I mean, the, what Peter mentioned, the democracy versus autocracy, it's part of this ideological war. And this is where I think Russia is very good at that. I mean, Russia is good at fighting ideological wars. It had, it had the, the, the Soviet experience. I mean, it was very, very good. I mean, if you remember, you know, the, in, during the, the, the Soviet era, the Soviet Union was pretty much the leader of the anti-Western world. I mean, you know, the, the, all these UN ambassadors like Daniel Patrick Moynihan, and they used to rant and rave at the United Nations. Why? Because, you know, most of the world was voting with the Soviet Union. They say the Soviet Union has this block and it keeps voting against us. So, so that, that, that's the Soviet experience. And the Russians have learned from that and, and are very good at fighting ideological wars. I don't see China as being good at that. Hence all these endless abstentions at the United Nations. You think, hey, why, why don't you, you know, make your vote count? Instead, they often abstain. So that's why I think the, the American strategy is to break up this alliance, smash Russia first, and then take on China. And, and just to back up what George is saying here is that, you know, uh, during the Cold War, the countries in the global South they didn't support the Soviet Union because no. it was communist, okay? It was because it was anti-Western yeah. and, and, and then bring it all the way up to the present where you know you have Joseph Burrell talking about the garden and the jungle and all that. And then Global South say, yeah, we've kind of heard this from you people before, yeah. okay? Right. Yeah. And, and so it, it's, it's, it, it's a, it, I wouldn't, you know, the West is obviously um, waging an ideological war, but the Global South, with the end of, of colonialism, 
is embracing an idea of sovereignty, okay? And, so, and sovereignty in every sense of the word. And they, as you've given us an example with Laos, you know, once you get a taste of that, you don't go back. And I think that's what the, and that's why I think the, 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 the ideological pitch from the West is becoming so vulgar because it is so divorced from the lived experience of so many people around the world. And, and actually, let's talk about autocracy versus democracy. If you think about what democracy really means, self-determination, that is actually what Russia, China, and, and this whole multipolarism is all about. It's about being uh, the primacy of the nation state, uh, the primacy of national sovereignty, their ability to decide for themselves what their foreign and domestic policies will be, um, how they organize their society. And so it, it, it's absolutely ironic that the West claims that it is, it is a fight between self-determination and autocracy, a global autocracy where the US dictates not only to nations across Eurasia, Africa, Central, South America, but also to Europe. I mean, the, the whole process of literally dismantling the Nord Stream pipelines, this was about the US coercing Germany to get in line to abandon its own best interests and get on board with this project. So it's, it's, it's a global conflict and it's being fought right now in Ukraine. And I think that's why Russia has to be so careful about the way they do this. I think it's making it much easier for China to back Russia. And I think China fully understands what is at stake here and, and they will continue. And it'll be easier for Russia, China, and then to bring in other partners to get them on board by doing it patiently, incrementally, and not doing, not doing what the West always does. I mean, you, you are trying to propose an alternative system for the world, and then you go into Ukraine exactly the way the US goes into every country. I think uh, there's a heavy price to pay in, in terms of life, in terms of you know, the, the, the timetables and everything, but I think the payoff showing that Russia is different than the West, I think that, that to them might be a payoff. So Brian, what, uh, yeah, where, where do we go then in the immediate future? What, what do you think is now going to happen in the next few weeks and the next few months? What, 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 what scenario do you envisage? I, I think Ukraine is going to continue pushing it as hard as it can with absolutely everything that it has because it, it knows, its Western sponsors know, they, they cannot win any sort of long-term long conflict. They have to throw everything that they have and try to make something stick now. And, you know, they're talking about Kharkov and Kherson. These are things that wouldn't have happened if Ukraine was thinking long-term. And we're trying to preserve the, the lives of their men and the, the equipment that's being sent to them. They built up this reserve of heavy weapons sent to them by the West to launch these offensives specifically for this purpose, to, to do it now all at once. Uh, so that's what they're going to continue trying to do. And Russia is building up their, their forces. They're bringing in uh, the people mobilized recently. And so I think the only thing that we, we can expect is the continuation of this grinding down of the Ukrainian military and now also its infrastructure. There's going to be a breaking point eventually. There has to be. And it's hard to tell whether Russia is going to launch some sort of offensive to kind of deliver the knockout blow, or if they're just going to continue grinding everything down until it collapses on its own. I think uh, both are possibilities. I, I think that the, the, there's at least public opinion here uh, would like to see an accelerated timeline. I, I, I think people really feel that. Um, we had, I, I want to throw out an observation. Unfortunately, it's not mine, it's Scott Ritter. Um, so we had him on, uh, I've had him a couple of times, right, George? Yeah. Um, and I, he made a really interesting point, and it's um, it's worth repeating here, is um, um, in the summer, Russia defeated the Ukrainian military. Now, in the, in, the, in the winter, they're going to defeat NATO as a military force inside of Ukraine. And I think that's what, I think Russia really wants to demonstrate that. Um, um, I think there's a... Obviously, um, it's almost uniformly agreed that we, uh, here, at least in Russia, it's we need to see the backside of NATO. Okay, because they, 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 enough is enough. That see, that's the attitude here. I mean, these people they they they've been uh, pestering us, they've been insulting us, they've been lying to us for decades. Now it's our turn, and we're and so the one of the most important end results 
is least neutering NATO. They can be a, a, um, a bridge club if they want and still call themselves NATO. That's fine. Nobody cares. Okay. They can, you know, groom dogs. Great. Okay. But as a, a self-proclaimed military alliance, uh, no, that's that's not going to stand. And that's one of the important outcomes here. Also, I think that what we could see with the degradation of infrastructure, um, pressure on uh, um, uh, internal pressures inside of Kiev uh, about who's going to call the shots. Because um, you, if, 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 when you have the entire country in, in darkness in the winter, um, it, that's not a status quo that is tenable. So I think there's going to be a lot of internal struggles inside of Kiev. Um, uh, the U.S. nothing without uh, nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine, which is so corny and so ridiculously stupid. Okay, people are gonna uh, it, the military. I mean, this is something that we keep hearing here. It could be misinformation. Uh, fine, it's it's a, this is a conflict. There's always come the fog of war. But I think that um, a, a new offensive, um, degradation of the infrastructure, um, uh, maybe with a very clearly signaling to NATO that you will be extinguished inside the borders of Ukraine. That is that is not that's not nothing that can be. Um, um, it can't be compromised, it can't be negotiated, that is a red line, okay? And I think these are the issues we're gonna to have to look at for the next weeks and months. And, and I think that's what we see materializing. I, I was listening to General Mark Milley talking about how <laughs> Russia can't achieve any of their objectives, but then admitting that neither can Ukraine. So if Ukraine's going to continue fighting on, but it can't actually achieve its main objective, expelling Russia from everywhere Kiev claims is Ukraine, uh, they're fighting and they're losing men and equipment in the process, and they never reach their objective. What what is being achieved? Demilitarization, which just so happens to be uh, Russia's first and most important objective that that they actually announced, rather than all of these objectives uh, General Milley was imposing on them, assigning to them. But but yes, demilitarization. This is what's happening, and at this point, it is. It's NATO's stockpiles that are being expended at this point. But I guess, <clears throat> I mean, they, can the NATO, the United States primarily, go on supplying this uh, military hardware? I mean, we've, we've had news reports saying that basically it's now the, the American stockpiles of weaponry is getting dangerously low. I mean, you know. Yeah, they left it in Afghanistan, George. Right. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, and America, of course, has commitments all over the world. I mean, you can't just throw everything uh into Ukraine. So and it, in that way, it'll take some time to produce new weaponry. But the point about Milley is that he all they want, all Milley and Austin won, is just to keep this war going. I mean, they, they don't really care about you know military objectives or Ukraine expelling Russians. As long as they keep killing Russians, as long as they can keep uh, bleeding Russia, uh, inflicting heavier and heavier costs on Russia, they will have achieved what they want to achieve. I mean, so therefore the question is, can Russia deliver a decisive knockout blow? Because it's not in Russia's interest to keep this war going. They have to yeah. deliver the knockout blow and, and then, you know, that's it, it's over. Uh, and we don't have to do this again for another 25, 30 years. And just to add on to that, um, 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 uh, ceding territory that was already under their control is kind of a, 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 a sore point if you get my drift here. Yes, well, I, I, I think that what they are trying to do is fight and win a war of attrition. And again, it's not just against Ukraine, it's against all of their Western sponsors. So uh, in, in terms of a knockout blow, a knockout blow, uh, blow to achieve what? And I think it is towards this, this end of defeating Ukraine and their sponsors in a war of attrition. And, you know, the United States they are, they're running out of their stockpiles and it will take years for them to get these factories, not, not just to replace what was lost, but to create enough uh, munitions, weapons and munitions every single month to, to exceed what Russia right now is putting out on the battlefield. Because again, this is something that Russia reconfigured its entire military around. And this is something the United States and its allies for decades, I mean, they have been fighting these small wars. That, that's how their militaries are configured. It, it will take years to reconfigure industry to fight this type of war of attrition. So as long as Russia can achieve this before Western industry uh, reaches parity or exceeds Russian military industrial capacity, I, I think they have a, a chance to win this. And they will, they will do it in the most thorough way possible, I think. I don't, 
I don't think they want to rush and make a mistake and end up making things worse. I think they want to do this as thoroughly as possible, just kind of like just like in in Syria. So you don't yeah, think they're going to just just to just follow up on that? You don't think they're going to go for a, a major offensive to try to take Odessa uh, or uh, you know take the Black Sea coast? You don't think that's what they're going to do? If well, let's just say Ukraine completely collapses. Uh, the you know the infrastructure, the military, everything is being worn down into a point of collapse. When it collapses, what what is actually going to be holding on to say? Kherson city or Nikolaev or Odessa, nobody. So th th it'll be an opportunity for Russia to take it without actually having to fight an extensive or, military or conflict. Just, just let it drop into its hands. Yeah, that, that's exactly. Yeah, exactly. That, that, because, you know, it, it's one of the things that, you know, I think that we have to think counterintuitively because, and, and it's something that, you know, George and I have stressed from for the very beginning. Well, one of the mistakes in trying to understand this conflict is through the way the West fights wars, okay? That's a fundamental mistake, okay? As you just pointed out, they don't fight conventional wars, they fight guys with goats, okay? Um, and so, you know, the, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that it's not what Moscow is going to control, it's what Kiev is going to be able to control. Because that, and, and that re reinforces your point. If, they, if they becomes a failed state in, in terms of infrastructure, then things just drop into their hands, okay? Because if because if the first goal is demilitarization, see that's what the offense will be is to destroy the Ukrainian army, not a battle, but to destroy them as a military force. Okay, the geography doesn't matter. Okay, yes. and I think that's the point. Okay, and so when the West gets obsessed, you know, oh, they're making you know the size of they, they can the uh, in one day they've taken the size of Delaware, which is a pretty small place. Okay, you know, to 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 say you know somehow that there is some kind of hope. I think that a smart way of doing this is to think less in terms of geography and think of terms of achieving the goal of demilitarization. And actually look at Kherson city. Uh, you, Ukraine tried to go in there. There's no power, there's no water. And then what do they announce? They announce uh, the beginning of, of an evacuation of Kherson city. So it's just ex exactly what you said. It's not about what Russia can control, it's about what what Ukraine can control. They cannot even control the city that they supposedly liberated. They can't control it. They cannot get it back up on its feet. If they cannot even get power and basic utilities running in the capital of Kiev, how are they going to do it in Kherson city with the Russian military right on the other side of the river? So uh, I think that is a, it may be too early to, to tell, but it seems like an example of exactly what you're talking about, Peter. But I guess then, um... I mean, what you're suggesting is that from Ukraine's perspective, just looking at it as what, what should Kiev do, uh, and therefore what the Americans would be telling Kiev uh, to do is don't mount any more offensives, consolidate, you know, basically hold on to what you have and basically try to re rebuild, replenish your armed forces. You know, the, the more you go off on these wild goose chases and these uh, foolish offensive, the more likely is that ultimately your army will be destroyed. Is, yeah, that, but is, that, fee is that a feasible strategy? No, no, but I mean, but one of the things, one of, again, it's a different approaches to the conflict. I have long held that these uh, uh, Ukrainian offensives, they're fundraising events. Okay, see, we're winning, we're winning. Give us more money, give us more arms. See, you have to do that. They say, oh, oh, okay, well, then these guys got to, you know, it's David and Goliath, you know, let's give these guys a shot, you know, you know, beat your chest, you know, wear the, the, the pin on your lapel. Um, and so that's, it's a, personally, I think this is a huge grift. Okay, that's what I see this here. And and that, and that goes with your thesis, George. That's a, that's a um, legitimizing uh, element of keeping the war going. They, they, they just took another farm. Oh, my goodness. You know, next stop, Moscow. Well, also think about it this way. I, I, I want to reiterate that Ukraine really does not have the ability to fight a long-term war against Russia. Neither, uh, apparently, neither does Europe and the United States. And so, uh, again, they had this military power this fighting capacity and, and the US and its allies were pumping in all of these weapons and they had a choice whether to just let Russia whittle away at it because that's what will happen. If Ukraine hunkers down, creates their defensive lines, Russia is just going to eat, eat away at it and also wreck their infrastructure. They're still going to degrade the military but just over a longer period of time. So they felt if we could just 
uh, overwhelm their defenses, embarrass them, maybe get some something going. This is exactly the same mentality that Germany had at the end of World War II. These offensives that they launched, completely futile, but that was the reasoning. It's, fut it, it's futile overall. We're not going to win militarily, but maybe we could get something going politically. We, we, we hear General Milley talking about, let's get a political settlement now. Let's do it now. And if Russia refuses, the only thing that's going to happen is uh, the infrastructure in Ukraine gets whittled down and so does the military. And how long can they sustain that? that that's the question. Well, Brian, I think this has been a really fascinating and uh, educational, very illuminating discussion. So thank you so much for uh, and, and, joining and Brian, us. Brian, you know, it, it's very nice to talk to someone that actually knows what he's talking about. <laughs> There's so many people that talk about this that have, don't have a clue of what they're talking about. OK, so uh, kudos to you. I hope we can do this again, maybe on a rolling basis. As, exactly. As, yeah, as do it on a regular yeah. basis. I think it would be very, very instructive for the gagglers, um, and and I have to say, uh, it was um, the number of gagglers wanted you on. They specifically wrote to us and say, "Why don't you have Brian Berletich on?" So you know, we we finally acceded to that request. So I'm very very happy we did so. Um, well, I'm glad you. Yeah, I'm glad that you had me on. I really enjoyed this. Uh, so thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, and remember, if you like the gaggle, please like, share, and subscribe. See you soon. Bye.